Good morning and happy holidays, everybody. And good morning, Steve Warren. Can you hear us? I can hear you loud and clear. How can you hear me, Jeff? You loud and clear. Uh, without further ado, over to you, sir. Great. Thank you very much. And good morning, Pentagon Press Corps. It's great to see you all again. I hope you had a nice holiday weekend. A lot of us here were able to talk to our families, and uh, some even got to see the new Star Wars movie. This morning, I've got a lot of news for you. I'd like to talk about Ramadi briefly before giving you an overview of the rest of the battlefield. Uh, I assume we have uh, our opening map up, number one. Uh, as you saw yesterday, the Iraqi security forces have achieved considerable success in Ramadi and have raised the Iraqi flag over the provincial government center in the downtown area. The clearance of the government center is a significant milestone and is the result of many months' hard work. The coalition conducted more than 630 airstrikes since July, with more than 150 occurring in the last month alone. We trained several of the Iraqi Army Brigade's CTS units and police forces who fought there. We provided specialized engineering equipment to clear IEDs, a floating bridge to help get combat power into downtown Ramadi, and we partnered with the Iraqis to give advice and assistance at multiple Iraqi Army headquarters. I'd like to show you our video of the CTS raising the flag, raising the Iraqi flag, over the Ambar Provincial Government Headquarters yesterday. So, Divids, please uh, roll that first video. Divids, do we have the video? Okay, it looks like we don't have a video, so I'll keep pressing. Uh, oh, video's coming up. This falls into the awkward silence category. Okay, Tom, if you could bring up the uh, Ramadi map next. The areas in green here on the Ramadi map are areas that the ISF have cleared. The unshaded areas have not yet been cleared. Now we can go back to the opening map. We've got several close fights ongoing that uh, I'll highlight for you today. Uh, in Sinjar, which is star number three on your opening map, we continue to keep relentless pressure on ISIL. As you may remember, when ISIL lost Sinjar last month, they also lost the ability to use Highway 47 between Raqqa and Mosul. They were forced onto much slower secondary roads through the desert south of Sinjar and Talafar. On December 25th and 26th, we conducted a series of strikes on these secondary roads in order to further degrade ISIL's ability to move fighters and supplies between Iraq and Syria. Let's take a look at uh, one of the airstrike videos uh, of that so you can see what I'm talking about for these roads. So let's try this second video. Divids and Tom, go ahead and uh, roll that second video.
Moving to Syria. In Tashreen, which is a new star on your map, it's star number eight, to the northwest of Raqqa, Syrian defense forces successfully captured the Tashreen Dam late Saturday evening. Now let's take a quick look at that area. Uh, so uh, pull up the Tashreen map now. This is the first time you've seen this map, so let me quickly orient you to it. Uh, Aleppo is to the left, numbered one. Two is the town of um, Manbij, which is at the center of the, of the Manbij pocket that we've sometimes spoken about. The Tishreen Dam is uh, number three, and of course number four is Raqqa there on the far lower right-hand corner of your screen. So the Tishreen Dam is a, is a hydroelectric dam on the Euphrates River. It sits about 56 miles east of Aleppo. The SDF, enabled by nearly 26 airstrikes over the last several days, rapidly advanced to seize the dam, which ISIL had held since November of 2012. Losing this dam is significant because it denies ISIL a, uh, an important logistics route uh, between the Mambij pocket and Raqqa. During the four-day offensive to capture the dam, the SDF liberated more than 10 villages and 235 square kilometers while coordinating strikes that killed over 100 enemy combatants. As I've briefly highlighted, this has been a busy week. As I've mentioned before, in addition to our tactical operation, we're also striking at the head of this snake by hunting down and killing ISIL leaders. Over the past month, we've killed 10 ISIL leadership figures with targeted airstrikes including several external attack planners, some of whom are linked to the Paris attacks, others had designs on further attacking the West. This is a long list, I'll quickly run through it. On December, on December 7th, we killed Rawand Dishler Tahir, an external operations facilitator killed near Raqqa, Syria. Tahir was a trusted ISIL member who was associated with command and control as well as the handling of and transferring of money and equipment. Also on 7 December, Khalil Ahmed Ali Alwais, also known as Abu Wadha, he was the ISIL Emir of Kirkuk province, killed near Hawija, Iraq. He had a long history of terrorist activities against the U.S. against the U.S. and Iraqi forces here in Iraq. On December 8th, Abu Anas, an ISIL IED cell facilitator, was killed near Kirkuk. His death will disrupt ISIL's ability to conduct IED attacks near Kirkuk. On December 9th, the coalition killed Yunus Kalash, also known as Abu Jadat, who is ISIL's deputy financial emir in Mosul. His death will burden senior cadre to find a technically skilled and trustworthy replacement. Also on December 9th, the coalition killed Mithak Najim, who was ISIL's deputy emir in Kirkuk province, who was killed near Hawija, Iraq. Najim's removal disrupts ISIL's ability to train, command, and maintain fighters in Kirkuk province. The next day, on December 10th, a Syria-based Bangladeshi named Sifu Haq Sujan was killed near Raqqa, Syria. Sujan was an external operations planner who was educated as a computer systems engineer in the United Kingdom. He supported ISIL's hacking efforts, their anti-surveillance technology, and their weapons development. Now that he's dead, ISIL has lost a key link between their networks. On December 10th, Akram Muhammad Saeed Ferris, also known as Akram Abu. He was an ISIL commander and executioner, killed near his base of operations in Talafar. On December 26th, Abdul Qadir Hakim, another ISIL external operations facilitator. He was killed in Mosul. Hakim was a veteran fighter, a forgery specialist, and had links to the Paris attack network. He was part of ISIL's external operations group who enabled attacks against Western targets. His death removes an important facilitator with many connections in Europe. On December 27th, 
Tashin Al Hayali, who is another external operations facilitator, was killed near Mosul. And last but certainly not least, and this is your headline, uh, Charafi Al Mudain. He was a Syrian based ISIL member with a direct link to Abdel Hamid Aboud, the Paris attack cell leader. We killed him on December 24th in Syria. Al Mudain was actively planning additional attacks against the West. So, my point is this we will continue to hunt ISIL leaders who are working to recruit, plan, and inspire attacks against the United States of America and our allies. That said, I'll now take your questions. Uh, I guess Bob or Lita, whoever's man in the shop for the Associated Press, let's start with you. Hi, Steve. Uh, thanks for doing this. Can you give us uh, just a, a few more uh, details on uh, two things? One, if you have any additional details on the death of this, um, this ISIL leader who had a direct link um, to the Paris attack, or um, the one who was killed on the 24th. And then uh, just on Ramadi, can you give us some um, better granularity on any casualties, the number of casualties that the Iraqis suffered, any casualties on uh, enemy side, and how many you believe may still remain um, in and around Ramadi as they move to clear it out? Not too many additional details uh, to present. Uh, he was killed by an airstrike in Syria, and that's really as far as we're going to go uh, on him for now. Uh, hopefully, as time goes on and we're able to develop some other things, uh, we'll be able to get some more information out. On Ramadi, and, and Tom or Jeff, go ahead and pull up the Ramadi map. Uh, and I'll get it here in front of me so I can speak off of it. Uh, Casualty counts are generally low. We don't have uh, exact numbers uh, of casualties for the Iraqi security forces. They keep those numbers. Uh, but generally speaking, our sense is that the numbers have been low, really in the low double digits, uh, if that, um, you know, 10s, 20s. But I don't have a good, I don't have a good uh, uh, accounting of that. Numbers remaining. I'll tell you, the numbers are small. We don't have a good count, a good head count of the enemy uh, in Ramadi. What we do believe uh, is that their capability is reduced, right? So often we think less about numbers and more about what can they do. Uh, and we don't think that the remaining enemy has the, uh, has the oomph uh, to push the Iraqi security forces uh, off of their positions. Now, that said, there have been counterattacks today. There were several counterattacks today, small. Uh, generally, these take the form of uh, a team, maybe with a heavy machine gun, uh, or maybe with an RPG, so a team three to five, uh, conducting harassing attacks. Uh, we have not seen this enemy uh, able to mass any type of combat, any type of real combat power uh, in, in any type of effort to really conduct a concerted counterattack. Doesn't mean it's not possible, just means we haven't seen it yet. We believe a majority of this enemy has been dispersed into smaller pockets. Many have moved kind of north and uh, east uh, in fact, you can see on the, on the map there, this area that we refer to as the Shark's Fin, where you can see kind of where the, uh, the Euphrates River there goes uh, north and then turns quickly south. Uh, we've seen a lot of them flow that way. They, we saw them actually loading up uh, families into their cars. Don't know if it was their own families or, or if these were uh, uh, others. We think it was their families. Uh, they load them up into cars and move into that, uh, into that Shark's Fin area. Uh, so we'll continue to track on them, eventually get them rooted out of there as well. But as far as the downtown Ramadi area, uh, we, we have not seen um, significant combat power. To uh, Jamie McIntyre. Uh, Steve, a uh, couple quick things. One is I, I hope you'll provide us with the list that you read from because I didn't get all the spellings uh, of the names that you pronounced. Um, but two questions about that. Uh, you mentioned that one of the leaders was killed in an airstrike. Were any of these... ISIL leaders killed by direct action on the ground by U.S. or uh, other forces. And two, uh, the broader question, every time we hear about uh, leadership being killed, uh, whether it's uh, ISIL or the Taliban or Al-Qaeda, uh, it's always uh, unclear what actual effect that has on the ability of the group to operate. 
Uh, you know, you mentioned all of these killings and you mentioned that they were important for whatever reason. Uh, but can you quantify at all this, these, this continued erosion of the ISIL leadership? What real effect is that having on the ground in terms of defeating ISIL? Yeah, fair question. So, uh, so all of the ten names that I read were all killed by airstrikes. Uh, uh, and I don't have a listing of what platform conducted each strike. Uh, many of these are, are conducted with uh, predators or other unmanned vehicles, but not exclusively. Uh, so I don't have the breakout, but they were all done from the air. How do these leadership uh, strikes affect this enemy? Uh, they affect them in several ways. First and, and foremost, I think any organization that sees its middle and upper management uh, degraded in this way is going to lose uh, some of their synergy, right? It's difficult to command and control an organization without a command and control personnel, right? Without leaders to be able to facilitate the activities, uh, your, your, your ability to conduct activities goes down. And I think we've seen some of that on the battlefield, right? We've seen uh, these, these string of success, these successes begin to pile up, right? We saw um, uh, Tikrit, and then Beji, and then Sinjar. We saw the Kurdish flot pushed uh, towards Kirkuk uh, significantly uh, through the fall. Uh, now we see Ramadi across the border in Syria. We saw al Hal. We saw strikes uh, in the tri-border area uh, um, uh, of Iraq, uh, Syria, and Jordan. Uh, we've seen the Mara Line operations, and now we've seen the Teshreen Dam. So part of those successes is attributable to the fact that this organization is losing its leadership. Uh, so we, we're striking at the head of this snake, like I said. We haven't severed the head of this snake yet, uh, and it's still got fangs. We have to be clear about that. There's much more fighting to do. Uh, but our ability to, to dismantle uh, their facilitation networks, our ability to dismantle their ground command and control, our ability to take away some of their enforcers, these executioners and these extortionists, that eats away uh, at their ability to instill fear in the population they control. It eats away at their ability to extort money from the population, which of course uh, reduces their funding. So all of, these, all of these various factors add up to a cumulative effect, and I think we've seen that effect with our, with our battlefield successes. And I think the other piece, if I could go on for just another moment, Jamie, the other piece is that several of these uh, HVI strikes were external attack planners, right? These are individuals who are specifically working to strike the West. They want to strike in Europe. They want to strike in our very own homeland. And it's important that people understand that as long as those external attack planners are operating, the United States military will hunt them, and we will kill them. Hey, Steve, I wonder if you can give us an estimate when Romani will be completely cleared. General Milley, the Army chief, was over there last week. He was told by Iraqi generals uh, they expected it to be completely cleared by mid-January. I wonder if you agree with that assessment. And also talk a bit about the importance of U.S. airstrikes here in Ramadi. There was an Iraqi officer quoted as saying 80 percent of the effort in Ramadi was due to American airstrikes. Well, I would agree that probably 80 percent of the effort, I would agree with that Iraqi officer who said that 80 percent of the effort in Ramadi was uh, due to coalition airstrikes. I think that's a fair assessment. We don't kind of keep those numbers. That's really just more instinct and feel, but I wouldn't argue with that. Uh, the airstrikes have been significant. We believe that uh, over the last six months, uh, in the over 600 strikes, uh, which translates to uh, over 2,500 kinetic events, 2,500 different targets uh, that destroyed, uh, you know, 70 uh, V-bed truck bombs, uh, almost 300 other enemy vehicles, uh, nearly 800 structures, 400 various types of, of weapon emplacements. This is significant. Uh, and this is what really facilitated or enabled uh, the Iraqi forces 
uh, to move in. And this is how modern warfare is, by the way. This is no different than uh, than than the way any army should fight. It's, it's using that air power as the force multiplier that it that it really can be. Uh, how long will it take them to clear the rest of Romani? Uh, too soon to tell, Tom. Uh, there are still so clearing is there's really two steps to that, right? Well, number one, um, eliminate the remaining enemy. Number two, reduce the obstacles, right? These IEDs, the booby traps, the you know the entire houses that have been rigged to blow. This is going to take a while because any any house uh, could be rigged to blow. Uh, and so as the Iraqi forces are trying to dismantle uh, these various booby traps, they still have to be on the lookout uh, for remaining bands of, of, uh, of ISIL fighters who are out to harass them. So it'll be a process. I'm not going to put a time on it, Tom, because uh, it'll be wrong. Uh, but it, it will take some time, I'll, I'll tell you that much. Thanks for doing this. Uh, there are reports that the U.S. landed forces in the vicinity of Kirkuk in an airborne operation. Do you confirm or deny these reports, Colonel? These reports are fantasy. I don't know where they come from. Presumably they come from uh, individuals who want to try to drive a wedge between the U.S. coalition and uh, the government of Iraq. Um, uh, yeah, it's, it's ludicrous. If, if we are going to put some uh, forces somewhere, if we're going to conduct a raid somewhere, we're going to do that in complete coordination uh, with, with the Iraqi government, period. My name is John Hines with One American News, and uh, thank you, Steve, very much for the information. Great stuff. I was wondering if you could comment on the willingness of the IA soldiers to stand and fight in the cooperation of the Golden Brigade and the IA, a little bit. Well, I think the Iraqi army's willingness to fight uh, is pretty well displayed in this Ramadi map, right? I mean, the um, having seized Camp Warar, having cleared the Tamim, uh, Al Tamim neighborhood, having seized the uh, Palestine Bridge, seized the um, uh, the Anbar Operations Center, the Zangora checkpoint, and now moving into downtown Ramadi. So I think their actions speak louder than any words uh, that I could produce here. Uh, but keep in mind, all of this is done in conjunction with uh, with this devastating air power that we're able to deliver, uh, you know, across the breadth and depth of this battlefield. Uh, uh, the Iraqi forces have worked well together. The com uh, the CTS, the Counter Terror Service, uh, have been in the lead in most of, in fact, most of these fights. Uh, the 10th Iraqi Division has the northern uh, sector up there uh, by the by the Ambar Operations Command, the yellow circle on your Ramadi map. Uh, that was all 10th 10th Division. Uh, the rest of it was a kind of a mix of of uh, counter terror service and uh, Iraqi Army um, conventional forces. Uh, but yeah, they, there's been uh, no notable issues uh, of these forces working together. Uh, Tony Capasio, on the uh, strikes, but are the leadership strikes? Did the French have any? In, did they do any, have any direct involvement in the strike that killed the Paris facilitator? And then I had a Ramadi follow-up. Tony, we're, I'm not going to get into that that level of detail. The French certainly are, are, are free to speak for themselves. What I'll tell you is, it was a, co uh, a coalition effort uh, in everything that we do here. Uh, and I'm going to leave it at that. What's your Romani question? Michael, what is the, what's the role of the Sunni militia? There's been a lot. What, is the, what has been the role? Have they been attacking or basically holding ground? And can you give a sense of how American training has played out in terms of what you and the Army would call combined arms operations in this offensive? Right, important question. And there's been a lot of discussion I've seen uh, in the news about the the, the Sunni fighters in their role here. So let me, I'll tell you a little bit about that. Uh, we've enrolled about uh, 8,000 Sunni tribal fighters in the PMF program. Uh, of those, we've trained about 5,000 of them. The way this training works uh, is that they come into a training location where Iraqi security forces provide the direct training. 
and those Iraqi security forces are overseen uh, by American forces. Uh, so it's American forces uh, providing guidance, advice, and assistance to Iraqi army trainers who are training Sunni uh, tribal fighters. Uh, the training uh, consists of some training in a garrison environment. The Sunni tribal fighters are then moved to, to sort of to the front line, if you will, uh, where they cycle through the battlefield uh, for, a, for a period of time, usually one to two weeks. They then come off the front lines, return back to the training site uh, to finalize their training, kind of figure out what they learned while they were on the front line. When that's complete, we now have a trained uh, Sunni tribal fighter who will be used uh, primarily as part of the holding and stabilization force. So they are beginning to cycle through, uh, well, they're really at the planning phase now, uh, to, of getting these tribal fighters cycled into downtown Ramadi, uh, where they will, they will form sort of the bedrock of the holding force in Ramadi. Does that answer your question, Tony? There's been a number of commentators saying the main reason this has succeeded is because Sunni tribal fighters have gone in to the, basically into the fight. You get a lot of TV commentators saying that. That's not what I get from you. They're basically going in, holding after the Iraqis have taken, the Iraqi military has taken the uh, territory. Right. The, the Sunni tribal fighters, uh, they cycle through, uh, you know, small groups uh, for short periods of time. They were not, uh, frankly, a, a significant player uh, in the seizure uh, of Ramadi. They will be significant players in the stabilization and the holding of Ramadi, uh, but up until now, their their presence, uh, while you know every man counts, uh, every every rifle matters, uh, they have not had a, a large, simply not a large enough presence to really to make much of a difference. Combined arms aspect of the attack. I mean, how is U.S. training played out here? Oh, thank you. I forgot. Yeah. Um, that, that, that's, I think, been a very important. Well, you know, what we've seen here, I believe, is something of a, a validation that uh, the training works, right? Which we, it's a, something we say in the Army all the time, uh, and we've seen it once again on the ground. Remember, the Army, the Iraqi Army that we left in 2011 was an Army that had been trained for counterinsurgency. That means route clearance, checkpoint operations, uh, IED reduction, that type of, that type of work. What the Iraqi army uh, that collapsed in, in 2014 uh, was a counterinsurgency army. They were not prepared, they were not trained, and they were not ready uh, for a conventional fight, the, the conventional assault uh, that ISIL brought uh, to Mosul and beyond. So the last year has been a process of, of reconstructing, rebuilding, and refitting uh, the Iraqi army. Uh, so now... They are outfitted with modern American equipment, uh, modern conventional training, uh, and of course supported by this devastating air power. But what are some exact examples of this combined arms training? Well, you know, number one, and I think probably most notable, is the river crossing. Uh, you know, the 814th uh, Combat Bridging Company uh, came here to Iraq to train the Iraqi Bridging Battalion. How to, how to do bridging operations. This is a complex operation. This is grown-up work here. This is advanced uh, warfare. Um, I, don't, I don't know that we've seen a bridging operation in the Middle East conducted uh, you know, by Middle East armies since the 1970s. Uh, so this is, this is advanced warfare. This is an advanced technique at any rate. Uh, and so they use that, those techniques to bridge the Tharthar Canal, which is a canal off the Euphrates River, gain a foothold in southern Ramadi, and then begin to push uh, into the center of town. Additionally, we've seen, uh, we've, we've seen some good work on the, in the combined arms breaching uh, side. The Iraqis fired a miklik uh, just the other day uh, in an attempt or in an effort to, to breach uh, the IED minefields that ISIL has set up along the southern approaches into downtown Ramadi. Uh, again, this is advanced work. This is using the principles of Sosra to, you know, secure, obscure, and reduce obstacles. Um, uh, so all of this has come to play, and I think the last piece is probably the integration of air and ground, right? The Iraqis now uh, have a functioning air force. 
uh, which includes some F-16s. And we've seen the Iraqis able to integrate uh, their, their air uh, with their ground, in addition to the integration of coalition air on their ground, uh, which is really, we have a much larger role in that. Uh, so all these pieces, I think, you know, bridging, um, obstacle reduction, training, equipment, has all come together here in Ramadi. But again, uh, I think it's really important to keep in mind uh, that we still have a fight ahead of us. Mosul is different than Ramadi. It's a big, big, big city. Uh, and it's going to take a lot of effort. Uh, it's going to take more training. It's going to take more equipment. And it's going to take patience. Hi, Colonel Warren. Uh, Tara Kopp with Stars and Stripes. Two on Ramadi. Um, on the attack phase, uh, were U.S. Apaches used? I know they'd been offered for the Ramadi campaign. And uh, are any particular uh, commandos or U.S. ground forces assisting in the attack on Ramadi? And then for the hold phase, could you describe the, the state of Ramadi right now? Can it function as a city, its infrastructure, water, sewer? Um, and as the Sunni forces move in, uh, will they be in mostly a, a policing role? Would there be like a ring of ISF around that to ensure that ISIS doesn't end up moving back into Ramadi after the fact? So there were no U.S. ground forces involved in any way, shape, or form uh, in the fight for Ramadi. There were no Apache helicopters. There were no attack uh, helicopters of any type. Uh, the only uh, coalition, the only U.S. involvement uh, in the fight for Ramadi has been the delivery of air power uh, and the training of Iraqi soldiers and advising and assisting the Iraqi security forces from their headquarters in Al-Takara. That's it. Status of Romani now. Uh, a little early to tell. Uh, there's been significant damage done to that city, I'll tell you right now. Um, uh, between uh, the damage done to it when ISIL seized the city initially, the damage that continued while ISIL held it, uh, and, and, and of course some of the damage that is just a natural result of, of modern urban combat, there is significant damage in that city. Uh, and it's going to take time to rebuild it. Uh, now, you know, we do know that both the United States of America and the coalition have pledged millions of dollars uh, uh, for the reconstruction, the rebuilding, and the stabilization of Ramadi. Uh, we expect soon we will begin to see, uh, once the security situation is stabilized enough, uh, the international community um, come in with humanitarian relief uh, efforts. Uh, and this is all part of the stabilization and, and a reconstruction plan that the governor of Anbar uh, is now working very closely with the Iraqi central government to finalize, to coordinate with the United Nations and other um, aid agencies so that we can, the moment that city is secure, get the needed help, get the money flowing, uh, and get the, uh, get the reconstruction going. And then uh, just to follow up on that, the, where the Sunni, would the Sunni forces be inside the interior of the city as like policing role when there still be a protective ring of ISF around Ramadi to prevent uh, ISIS returning? Yeah, the, so it'll, it'll be the Sunni tribal fighters along with um, uh, police, right, both federal and, and local police who will provide the security and the stabilization for Ramadi. Um, you know, it's up to the Iraqi security forces how they will further deploy and further use their forces. Uh, right now, we envision the Iraqi security forces uh, moving to other, uh, other battlefields. Hey, Steve. Uh, Tara, actually, just covered most of my questions, but on the U.S. and... <coughs> Sorry. Uh have a cold. Uh, on the U.S. and Ramadi, uh, are there any advisors in there now in any place? Are they anywhere closer than Takadam helping the Iraqi security forces? And there were some reports yesterday that ISIS was leaving Ramadi as the Iraqi security forces started moving into the government center. Do you know where they're going? Are, you mentioned the shark fin or whatever area near the river, but are they actually leaving the city and going to other cities like Fallujah or moving west or do, do you have any, um, uh, any insight into that? And then I have one question on the HVTs after that. So 
there are no U.S. ground forces located uh, anywhere other than Takatam. No U.S. ground forces located anywhere other than Takatam. Takatam is where all the ground forces were that were that were advising and assisting the Iraqi security forces as they conducted this fight. No one went moved forward from there. The uh, the enemy enemy disposition. Yeah. So we, I think the the. the the few that remain alive, and I think those numbers are, are relatively small, uh, are moving mostly into that shark's fin area there to the north and east. Uh, surely some onesies and twosies probably managed to slip through and into Fallujah. That, that's probable. Um, uh, the, rest, the rest are dead. And I don't mean to belabor the point, but there are still no U.S. anywhere outside of Takatam in near Ramadi at this point, right? Not just for the, the clearing phase in the past couple of days, but even today. Yeah, the U.S. forces are only in Takatam. What about the guy who was killed on the 24th in the airstrike? You said that he was actively planning attacks against the West. Did any of those include attacks against the U.S. homeland? Can you give us any specifics on that, or were they broader against Europe? I, I don't have that uh, level of detail uh, for release, uh, Courtney. Um, we're, all, we're just going to say the West. Uh, but, you know, it, it's important to note that all of these uh, terrorists had eventual designs on, on attacking the United States. Let's be clear about that. That's what they want to do. Um, as far as the stage of their attack planning, we're not going to go into those details yet um, because, you know, we want to preserve some of our options to, to continue striking these, uh, these terrorists. Thank you. <coughs> Gentlemen from the BBC, Paul. <coughs> Uh, hi, Colonel Warren. Uh, there's some reports that 400 people are in the, the Ramadi government complex with the Iraqi forces. Do you have any information on that? And in the lead up to this assault, uh, you talked a lot about civilians within the city. Where are they now? Uh, are they secure? Have they fled? Um, where have they gone? There are 400 uh, uh, civilian citizens uh, that have come to the Ramadi city center to seek shelter. The Iraqi security forces have, have uh, received them and are, are doing all the right things as far as uh, settling them down and administering to, to their needs. And I missed, you broke up there on the second part of your question. Said in the, um, in the lead up to this assault, you talked to a lot about the civilians inside the city. Where are they now? Presumably, you're talking about a lot more than 400. Have they fled? Are they somewhere secure? Where are they now that the city has has been largely taken back by ISF? Yeah. Uh, so too soon to tell. Uh, presumably, some left. Others uh, uh, went into hiding. Uh, so again, keep in mind, and you see on your on your Ramadi map there. There are still bits of Ramadi that uh, the Iraqi security forces have not yet had a chance to clear. That's the area that's not shaded. Uh, the point there south of the Anbar Ops Center uh, and then moving east. So this area all has to be still cleared as the Iraqi security forces move into these neighborhoods. They will likely meet some resistance, uh, ambushes, IEDs, and the like. Uh, and as they're doing that, they will be looking for civilians uh, who are in hiding or who are being held uh, and, and administered to their needs as well. We don't really have a good count, though, at this point of, of how many remain in the city. Do you tell any of the, the sort of booby traps that the ISF are running into or the, the sort of IEDs and, and rigged houses? And then the second question is the drone video of the flag being raised. Do you think that'll be released today? I think that's what you were trying to show us earlier. Right. Um, maybe we can reset it and try to show it at the end. Maybe we'll close out with the flag being raised. Uh, and yeah, they'll all be posted on, uh, on the CJTFOIR website. Uh, the booby traps that uh, we see the you know, ISIL forces setting, a lot of them are homemade explosives. Uh, so they will, they will get their hands on fertilizer and, and other types of uh, chemicals that are able to 
be combined into make an explosive charge. Uh, some are, are with captured military equipment that they've captured over the years, whether it's in Syria or in, uh, in Mosul, and they'll fashion the, this captured military equipment uh, into improvised explosive devices, we call them IEDs. Uh, and so they'll use these in various ways. It's often tripwire, sometimes it's pressure plates. Uh, and they'll, they'll use these uh, improvised explosive devices, often buried underground, uh, so that um, forces can't see them as they approach, often inside of a house, uh, and there'll be either a, a tripwire or a pressure plate uh, somewhere in the vicinity of that house, uh, which, when triggered, will cause the entire house uh, to detonate. Uh, so these are some of the, you know, some of the kind of what we're seeing here out in Ramani. Uh, Colonel, at their peak, how many ISIS fighters occupied Ramadi? <clears throat> Difficult to know. The max peak, you know, we think it, at points it probably was as high as 800 to 1,000. Um, you know, again, as, as any force does, uh, they will reposition. Uh, so, you know, when, as of... Uh, when the Iraqi security forces crossed the river into to enter southern Ramadi, <clears throat> we believed at that point there was maybe 250 to 350 left in the center of town. Since then, uh, we've killed at least 100 of them from the air. Uh, so the numbers continue to to uh, to be reduced, um, and <clears throat> you're going to continue to see that as as the Iraqis learn how to conduct uh, offensive operations. What happens is. As offensive operations place pressure on an enemy, a dug-in enemy or an enemy in the defense, they will cause that enemy to have to move. And as soon as they move, they then, they then make themselves a target uh, for American and coalition air power. Uh, so we put, this in, you know, we put ISIL in this spot where he can stay where he is and get shot, or he can get up and move and be bombed, uh, which is a tough choice to make, uh, but always ends up with the same result. Did any Shia militias take part in any of this uh, operation to clear Ramadi? There were there were no Shia militias involved in, in, in this operation for Ramadi. Primarily, we see the Shia militia really operating more in the Tigris River Valley. There are some in the Euphrates River Valley as well, but primarily their focus has been in the Tigris River Valley, and, and the Ramadi fight in particular has been uh, exclusively an Iraqi army and a CTS fight. Uh, in Fallujah, it's primarily Iraqi army, um, uh, primarily Iraqi army, the vast majority Iraqi army, um, but maybe not completely. Uh, but it's in the Tigris River Valley where we see the, uh, uh, um, the PMF operating. Uh, Steve, um, <clears throat> I'm wondering if you could tell me if you see or have heard reports of any type of uh, follow-on uh, insurgency-style campaign from uh, ISIS and its sympathizers in, in the green-shaded areas that the uh, IA has, has cleared. Um, are you seeing any evidence of that, or do you have any uh, expectation or concerns about that, or do you think this is going to be a pretty uh, clear win and you'll clear these guys out entirely? It's a little early to tell right now. Uh, we can, ex we certainly need, have to, and should expect to see some type of, you know, guerrilla insurgency operations. Uh, but frankly, there aren't many left uh, even to conduct those operations. You got to remember, uh, the approach that we've taken here uh, has really put ISIL in a tough spot. Right? It's this operationalizing of the battlefield. So as we've pressured Ramadi, as we've uh, uh, you know, rooted out the entrenched enemy there, there simultaneously is pressure being put against this enemy everywhere. So for them to be able to move forces around and conduct these type of operations becomes more difficult. You know, it's like a fighter. Uh, you don't, you, the way you win a fight is through combination punches, right? You throw multiple punches, uh, you know, two jabs across, two hooks. Uh, and that's what we're seeing, that's what you're seeing us uh, do against this enemy, right? Whether it's the Teshin Dam, whether it's the Moral Line, whether it's Al Hal, Sinjar, Beji, 
Ramadi, bombs in Mosul, whether it's striking their, their uh, HVIs, their leadership targets, or, or taking away their ability to make money through Operation Tidal Wave. It's this smothering pressure that's beginning to build on this enemy uh, that's, causing them, uh, that's causing them real, real trouble. Again, I don't want to be, uh, give a bad impression. Uh, this is a big enemy. Uh, he's still got uh, capability. Uh, he is still spread out throughout this uh, operating area. Um, but but these, the, these combination punches that we're throwing uh, are beginning to uh, take effect. Uh, next, Jeff. Colonel Warren. You said that the Iraqi casualties were in the low double digits. You had talked about this being a very ferocious fight. In the end, did the Islamic State fighters not put up the type of fight that was expected? Did they kind of just try to run and, and, and get cut down? And also, you talked about the leadership, but overall, what has the U.S. air campaign, including and then the actions by the ground forces in Iraq and, and the Syrian ground forces, <coughs> done to the overall strength of, of the Islamic State fighting force? Yeah, so, um, you know, the overall strength of the fighting force we still estimate to be somewhere between 20 and 30,000. Uh, they have a robust recruiting program that's been acknowledged. Uh, and so this is something that we have to deal with. Um, and I forgot the first part of your question. In, in Ramadi itself, you said that the casualties for the Iraqi uh, army was in low double digits. Did the Islamic State militants inside Ramadi in the end not put up the type of ferocious fight that you had been expecting? Now, there was tough fighting. There was, there was tough fighting, uh, particularly in the last week uh, when the Iraqi security forces crossed the bridge uh, and, and moved north into the city center. Uh, we, saw, we saw real uh, hard fighting, um, but it was ineffective, right? I mean, uh, the Iraqi security forces had, uh, you know, the unparalleled ability of the coalition air to place pressure on this enemy and suppress them. Uh, the, the CTS, in this case, uh, they're becoming much more well-trained and they're experienced now, uh, so they, they know how to fight. Uh, so really this was, in this case, frankly, it was overmatched. Uh, and, and the ISIL forces simply couldn't, couldn't withstand the pressure. Hi, um, David Smith of, is he still speaking of it? No, the floor is yours. Um, no, he's talking. When, when we had... We saw Sinjar, uh, when we had overwhelming uh, combat power amongst the Peshmerga and Sinjar Mountain push south off that mountain into Sinjar, we saw the same thing. In effect, you asked me the exact same question. Why didn't ISIL put up as big of a fight? I'll tell you why. Because they're not 10 feet tall. These guys are not that tough. They're not any tougher than any other, um, any other fighter out there. And when, 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 uh, Iraqi security forces or any other forces